If you got your Bible, open to the book of Psalms chapter 84. Psalm chapter 84. This is one of the most beautiful chapters in all the Word of God. Psalms chapter 84. I was doing some study on this particular scripture, and what I found out is that most, if, you, if you're reading from your Bible, the pages in your Bible, you know, handheld Bible, not a digital Bible. If you're reading from your Bible, there's usually a title at the top, and it'll say, A Song by the Sons of Korah. A Song by the, song, by the Sons of Korah. Now, most people believe that David authored this Psalms, but somehow the Sons of Korah were involved. There's a very unusual scripture. You guys, if, you, if I can get my podium out here, I'm going to need my Bible to preach today. Thank you so much. They do a great job. So the sons of Korah had a particular job, I found out. They're mentioned in the book of Chronicles, and it's a very unusual scripture. But in this book of Chronicles, the sons of Korah are being placed. Now, guess where the sons of Korah were positioned to minister to God. Now, here's the sons of Korah, and they're helping write this Psalms chapter 84. Guess what the assignment for the sons of Korah was? You don't know. I know you don't know because I just found out and I got excited. They were assigned to be gatekeepers in the house of God. When I read that, I said, that's my psalm right there, Psalm 84. So this is a psalm for the gatekeepers. Turn to somebody and ask them, are you a gatekeeper? Because that's what city gate's about, gatekeepers. So Psalm chapter 84 we're going to start reading with verse number one. Hey, you know what we do when we open the Bible around here, right? There we go. We get excited about the Word of God. Verse one. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh Cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and a swallow her nest for her young, where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Verse 4. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on Pilgrimage. Pilgrimage means he is making his way to the house of God. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. What he's saying is when a person's heart gets set on the house of God, God's going to make a way even through dry, desolate places for you to get in the house of God if you really want to be here. They go from strength to strength. I like that he doesn't say weakness to strength. But if your heart's affection is the house of God, you go from strength to strength. You're not weak today. You're just not as strong as you could be. But being in the house of God, you're getting stronger than you were last week. So you're moving from strength to strength. Oh, Lord God. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. O God, behold our shield and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and the shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. I'd rather spend one day in your house than a thousand in the tents of the wicked. Can you just lift your hands right where you are? And I want you to thank God for his house. We thank you, God, for the refuge called your house. We thank you today, God, for your church. Thank you that we can assemble together to find strength, that we're moving from strength to strength in this house for the grace that is in this house, Father. You've made a way for us to be here today. When we put our heart on you and being in your house, God, you made a way for us all to be here. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Second John chapter 1, verse 8, you don't have to turn there, says this. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things 
we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Do you know it is possible that in your walk with God, you can make progress but lose everything you've gained? In your walk with God, you can make progress and lose it all because the enemy is fighting you to take your full reward. There is a devil that doesn't want to allow you to get your full reward. But when you come to the house of God, you're letting the enemy know you're not going to take anything from us. You're not going to take our families, our marriages, our children, our finances. Do you know what you being in the house of God is today? It is a declaration of war against the forces of hell. You are letting hell know this morning by your attendance in God's house. If you're going to mess with me, you better be ready for a fight because I'm in the presence of God. But too many people are living a question mark life, not an exclamation. See, when I said we're ready to declare war, that's an exclamation. But when you're not in the house, it's a question mark. Empty seats. Now, I am thankful that God has blessed City Gate Church that we have a lot fewer empty seats today than we used to have. I'm thankful that we have more people than we have empty seats this morning. But there's still, if you look around and go ahead and do it, there's still empty seats all around you. Empty seats in the house of God. Empty seats that are asking questions. In Samuel, the Bible says, in 1 Samuel, the Bible says that Saul invited David to a dinner, but he invited David to a dinner with evil intentions. He wanted to kill David. And so David said to Jonathan, I'm not going to dinner tonight because your daddy wants to kill me. Jonathan said, it's not so. That's not true. He said, yes, it is. I'll tell you what. Jonathan, you go to dinner. If your daddy asks where I am and he asks out of concern, then you'll know that he loves me. But if he gets angry when I'm not at the table, then you'll know that he has ill intentions, evil intentions to harm me. So the first night came, and David wasn't at dinner, and his seat was empty. And Saul said, where is David? Where is David? His seat is asking questions. And then the second night came, and Saul asked again, Jonathan, where's David at? And Jonathan said, well, he's gone over to Bethlehem. He went back home. And Saul said, he did not. You're lying, my son. He should have been here because if he was here, I would have killed him. But his empty seat was asking questions. Where's David at? What's David doing? What's David up to? Why is his seat empty? He always sits right there. How come he's not sitting there today? An empty seat was asking questions. I remember when I was a kid growing up in the church. So we would have Sunday morning service. We'd have Sunday night service. And we'd go out to eat after service. And I can remember when it was just myself and my parents. And we'd go out to eat. I was a little boy. I can remember mom and dad would begin to talk. And they would say, you know, so-and-so wasn't at church today. And -and so-and-so wasn't at church. I, I wonder where they were. You see, back in the old days... You had a seat in the house. And you always sat in that seat. That's the reason we didn't grow much. Because we ran off any new visitors. Because we weren't willing enough to give up our seats. We'll find you enough. This is my seat. I've been sitting here for 20 years. You knew where so and so sat in the house. They always sat there. And so my mom could stand up while they were singing. And she could just look around. And she could tell you who wasn't in church that day because their seat was empty. I thought, man, this is incredible. And they would sit there and start talking. They'd say, I wonder what's going on with so-and-so. You know, I noticed they've been slipping a little bit. I wonder if they've backslid and they're out of church. I wonder if they're sick today. I wonder if there's something going on in their family. I wonder if they're upset at the church. I wonder if they're hurt at me. I wonder if they didn't like what I preached. And I would hear my parents ask all these questions. But what I came to realize was that person's seat was the one that was asking the questions. Where are they today? 
Why aren't they here today? Do you know that when you leave an empty seat in the house of God, your empty seat begins to ask questions that everybody in the church hears? Well, where's she at today? She always sits next to me in church. I wonder if she's backslid. I wonder if she's out of the house. I wonder if they fell back into drugs. I, I wonder if their marriage is having problems. Your seat is asking questions. No empty seat. There should be no empty seats that distract the pastor from doing what he's supposed to do when he comes in the house. Now you look around you and you see that empty seat. Just look around you. You'll see, you'll see an empty seat. Now that's what you see. But when I look out there and I see an empty seat, this is what I see. I hope you're getting the message today. And what I have to do is I have to get up and I have to preach and I have to hear God. And this is all I see. And the questions are just as big. Why weren't they at church today? They didn't call. They didn't tell their leader, their ministry leader, they weren't going to be at church. What's going on? Why aren't they in the house of God? Why is there empty seats in the house of God? And we've got a house that's filling up with question marks. And not exclamation points. Question marks. Where are they? We need people who are ready to make a mark. Because just as big as the empty seat is when nobody's in it, that's how big you look when you're in it. See, when I look out here and I see people filling seats... I see an army that's ready to take on the forces of hell. I see a big army that's bigger than anything the devil can throw at us. Every time you stay home, and I'm not, please don't, please don't take this to the extreme. And well, pastor, you saying we can't go on vacation. You say, that's not what I'm saying. See, I know some of you are feeling real good right now. Look, he's preaching a message about people not in church. I'm here today. It's the first time you've been here in seven weeks. <laughs> Let this message count for the other six weeks you weren't here. Every time you stay home and refuse to go to the house of God, that is a vote to close that church. You have voted to close that church down, lock the doors, stop the ministry. I don't care. Nobody else should. The percentage of Americans regularly attending church is only 18.7%. 18.7% of Americans regularly go to church. Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 16. Thus says the Lord, stand in the way and see. Ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. But the people said, we will not walk in it. All of us need a time of reflection where we break it all down and we just concentrate on God. After everything that's happened in the week, there ought to be a time where we just focus on God. And God said, you will find this if you get back to the old ways. At church today, in churches today, the trend is how little church can we have and still build a church. Some of you wouldn't make it if you'd have grown up with me as a kid. Because we had prayer meeting on Tuesday night, church on Wednesday night, choir practice on Thursday night, a youth outing on Friday night, and church on Saturday night, Sunday school on Sunday morning, and then service following Sunday school, and then church again on Sunday night. And bless God, when revival came, you were there until the evangelists were done. And some of you are like, oh, once a week. I got to go once a week. It's, it's a Sunday and I got to go to church. I don't have time. Hour and a half, two hours on a Sunday morning and you're out of time. You know what? You know what we need in America? We need people getting back to the old way. 
That would make a difference in America. That would make a difference in our home. We need parents who are going to tell their kids, church is going to be a priority in this house. We're going to dig deep roots in the house of God. And God says when we plant roots, he's going to bless the fruit. We need to teach our families God is a priority and God's house is a priority. Tell somebody, welcome home. Welcome home. Why do you need to be in the house of God? It keeps you from falling. It's a lot easier to stay saved if you go to church. Hebrews 10.25 Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching 80 years following the ascension of Jesus Christ and people are already going around saying church is unnecessary. 80 years after Jesus Christ ascended to the right hand of the Father and they're already saying church is pointless. Hebrews says there'll come a day when people don't want to assemble. Don't allow yourself to be disassembled. To maintain a Christian life in this day and time, assembly is required. Compared to regular church goers, the unattached are more likely to feel stressed out. Less likely to be concerned about the moral condition of a nation. Much less likely to believe that they are making a positive difference in the world. People that don't go to church are less optimistic about the future. Far less likely to believe that the Bible is totally accurate in its principles. Substantially more likely to believe that Satan and the Holy Spirit are symbolic figures, but they're not real. More likely to believe that Jesus Christ sinned while he was on this earth. Much more likely to believe that the holy literature of the major faiths all teach the same principles, even though they're telling different stories. Less likely to believe that a person can be under demonic influence and more likely to describe their socio-political views as mostly liberal than mostly conservative considered considering morals. If we don't go to church, it won't be long until you start wandering back into the ways that God brought you out of. It won't be long until you get back into the same old junk that you know left you feeling empty. And it leaves you feeling lost and doesn't make you happy. The key to victorious living in this last day, go to church. Punch somebody and tell them, go to church. Tell them, I'm not talking about you this week. I'm talking about you next week. Go to church. Hebrews 10, 25. Let us not neglect the meeting together. As some people do, but encourage and warn each other, especially now that the day of his coming back again is drawing near. In today's age, faithfulness to the house of God has never been more important. Why? Just because you're asleep doesn't mean the devil is. He knows what time it is. He knows the days are winding down. He knows that we're living in the last days. He knows that Jesus is coming back again. And he is going to fight you with everything he can. He is going to throw every, he's going to turn up the heat. But you know what I say to the devil? Let's kick it up a notch. You turn it up to there, we're going to turn it up to the notch. We're going to get more faithful. We're going to serve more. We're going to worship more. We're going to be in God's house more. Think about it. Church is like the practice before the game. The game's out there through the week. This is the practice. If you can't live it in the house, how are you going to live it outside of the house? If you can't worship in the house, how are you going to worship outside the house? If you can't be faithful in the house, how are you going to be faithful outside the house? This is the practice for the big game. You don't win Unless you practice. Now if you're in here today and you're still getting up and you're debating. Are we going to church today? Don't really feel like it. You know what? Forgive me. I just got preached like a pastor this morning. You need to get saved. And then you need to get filled with the Holy Ghost. 
if you're still debating whether or not I feel like going to church, I doubt your salvation. It's in a corporate gathering that God will speak to us. Now think about it. Let's get real for a moment. There have been times, you tell me about it in the foyer every Sunday. Pastor, I was so tired today, and I didn't feel well today, and I didn't really want to be here today, and I was depressed today. I'm telling you, some of you testify better for the devil than you've ever testified for God. I didn't feel, I wanted my seat to be empty today, but I came to church, and did you know that in your message, you said something that was exactly what I've been going through this week? You made one statement, and it was exactly what I was fighting this week. And I was tired when I walked in, but the moment you made that statement, my spirit began to stir on the inside of me. And I jumped to my feet and began to work. I'm happy now. I'm full of life now. I'm full of energy now. What happened? You got in the house. God can't preach to empty seats. He can only preach to seats where there's ears sitting in them that'll hear what he has to say. And I'll tell you this, if you come in listening, God will always have a word that you need for that day. Somebody give him praise in the house. You might have come in tired, but now you're feeling life. You may have come in depressed, but now you're feeling joy. Psalms. 122 verse 1 I was glad when they said Hallelujah I was glad tell somebody I was glad tell them I was glad Come on, touch somebody and tell them I was glad. It didn't bother me when they said we had church this morning. It didn't upset me when they said we had church this morning. I didn't complain when they said we had church this morning. No, I jumped to my feet. I said, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I couldn't go to sleep last night because I knew when I woke up it was going to be time to go to the house of the Lord and there's joy in the house and peace in the house and power in the house. Somebody give him praise if you're glad that they said to you, let us go. I, hold on. I get to go? I get to go to church today? You mean after all the hell I've put up with on Monday and Tuesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday, I get to go to church today? I've fought all week and I'm tired and I'm exhausted, but today I get to go to the house of God? I get to leave this mess? I get to leave hell behind and step into heaven? Come on, if you're glad you get to go to the house of God, give him the biggest praise. Tell somebody I was glad. I was glad when I got to walk out of the world and into church. I was glad when I got to leave my problems behind. I was glad when I got to step out of depression into praise. I was glad. Touch five people. Tell them I'm glad that I'm in the house of God. and say see you're not going to take my joy you're not going to take my praise you're not going to I'm not going to let you sit empty and get what God had for me I'm glad they said to me let us go to the house of the Lord
You know what you're doing right now? You're not asking questions. You're making an exclamation. I'm glad. I'm glad. Make a mark. Make a mark. Somebody make a mark right now. Somebody make a mark. I'm here. Hey, devil, look at this. I'm here. You did everything you could to stop me, but I'm still here in the house of God. Despite your best attack, despite your best advance, despite everything you tried, I'm in the house. I'm in the house. Somebody shout, no empty seats. No empty seats. Psalms chapter 84 verse 1. How lovely is your tabernacle. O Lord of hosts, my soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. There is an escape from the pressures of this world. It's called the house of God. And David said, my soul and my heart longs for, even faints for the house of the Lord. You know what David was saying, the interpretation? I want to go to church. I want to go to church. Psalms 84.3, even the sparrow has found a home and a swallow a nest for herself. You know what the sparrow is? It's a worthless bird. It's a bird nobody wanted. But yet it found home, a home in the house of God. See, I don't care what people have said about you. You're nothing. You're nobody. You're welcome in the house of God. O Lord of hosts, she lays her eggs, lays her young, even your altars. O Lord of hosts, my King, my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will Still be. Still be. Tell somebody still be. They will still be. How do you make it through the trials and the storms and the heartaches that are going on in your life? Because I've dug roots into the house of God. And God has promised me that even when the storm comes, when it's over, I'm still going to be praising you. And when the, when the problem comes and it's over, I'm still going to be praising you. And even when it's dark all around me and I can't see my hand in front of my face, I'm going to be in your house and I'm still going to be praising you. See, I believe most of our problems can be minimized if you just stay in the church. Stay in the church. Tell somebody no empty seats. No empty seats. I still believe the church is where power is. There's victory in the house. Psalms 84.10. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Be thankful you're in the church. Let me, can I just talk to some good old Used to be sinners for a moment. Do you remember all the problems when you was in the world? Do you remember what it felt like when you was going to bed? You're so drunk you're falling out of the bed, waking up with a hangover, puking your guts out the next morning. Do you remember what it was to be strung out on drugs just trying to get your next fix? And then somebody brought you to the house of God. I wonder if somebody could just praise God because you remember what it used to be before you got in the house. See, I want you to get to a place where you say, look, I had some fun while I was in the world. I partied while I was in the world, but ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party because a Holy Ghost party don't. I believe somebody's about to shout in this house, praise in this house, celebrate in this house.
Every time. Every time. Stay standing for a moment. Every time you open that door and you walk into the house, you may not say a word, but you know what you just did? You just reminded the devil of what he lost. Hey, I would have been a good sinner, but you lost me. I got in the house. I would have been a good drug addict, but you lost me. I got in the house. I would have made a great prostitute, but you lost me. Now I'm a woman of God. I'm in the house. You, you remind somebody, remind Satan of what he lost today. I'm glad I'm in the house. Church is not just another place. It's the house of God. Be seated for a moment. Praise God. You can come to the music. Is this all right today? Peace is in the house. Joy is in the house. Overflow is in the house. Love is in the house. Forgiveness is in the house. Salvation is in the house. Healing is in the house. Blessing is in the house. Thank God for his house. And thank God that we're welcome here. It's a place like no other in the world. You can lift up your hands. So I'm thankful I can lift up hands without wrath or doubting in the house of God. I'm thankful that I can clap unto God. And shout with a voice of triumph when I get in his house. Don't. Don't let your seat be empty. Tell somebody, don't let your seat be empty. Here's what I'm saying. Stop allowing your seat to preach your message. Stop letting your seat preach your message. You get in here and you sit down and you start preaching your own message. Your seat's asking too many questions about you. Get in here and shut your seat's mouth and say, I'm done with the question marks. I'm about to become an exclamation mark. Don't let your seat preach your message. Make a mark. Tell somebody, make a mark. Psalm 23 ends with a declaration. David has been blessed. He has been through some difficult times. But in the middle of a valley of a shadow of death, God has kept him from the fear of evil. God has prepared a table before him in the presence of his enemy. He has anointed David's head with oil. His cup is running over. And then David says, when I look back and I see all that God has done for me, and all that God has brought me through and how he has blessed me and how he has kept me from harm, he begins to stand up and declare, surely, surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Somebody declare, as for me and my house, we will, we will be in the house of the Lord. Give God praise if you got a good church. Give God praise if you think you got a good church today. Praise God. Be seated for a moment. There is life in here. You know what there is out there? Death. There's life in the house. You find life in the house. Out there, you find death. So here's what I said. I remember when I was first starting preaching, God gave me this thought. I said, you can either be in the corner, corner, or you can be in the coroner. Let me explain what I mean. There's, there's life in here. There's death out there. You can either be in the corner or the coroner. 
if you're at the coroner, you're dead. But if you get into the corner, see, when you're in a boxing match and you're tired and you're missing blows and you're missing punches, but if you can just hang in there until the clock runs out, they're going to ring the bell. And you know what's going to happen when they ring the bell? They're going to say, go to your corner. And when you get to the corner, you're going to sit down. And your coach is going to walk up to you. And he's going to splash some water in your face. And he's going to slap you on the face and say, come on. You got this. Don't you give up now. Come on. He's weak over here. Fight him right there. Punch him right here. Throw your blows right here. And then he's going to say, now get back out there and fight another round. Fight another round. Fight another round. Fight another round. Tell somebody you're in the corner this morning. Slap them around a little bit and tell them you're about to fight another round. Don't give up now. Don't quit now. Come on. Come on. Come on. You can do this. Take a deep breath. You're going back out there. You may have got some shots in, but you're going to win this round. You're going to win. to go back out and fight another round. You're about to go back out and fight another round. Let me tell you, stay standing, let me tell you what these empty seats say. These empty seats speak to visitors. Empty seats talk to visitors and they say, well, if their own people don't want to come, why should you want to come here? Let's shut the mouth of the empty seats, amen? It says... Empty seats say to the pastor, you're not going to have enough. Here's what I learned about empty seats. They don't give anything. Empty seats don't contribute. They don't give. You know what empty seats also say? I don't value your son's blood enough to be in your house on Sunday. That's what empty seats say. But they say one more thing. See, empty seats, when they get filled, they speak to the devil. And they say, victory is just around the corner. If you was going to take me out, you should have kept me from getting into the house. You should have kept me. Tell the devil, you should have kept me home today. You should have kept me in the bed today. But you let me get in the house. And the enemy has been defeated And death couldn't hold you down We're gonna lift our hands in victory We're gonna make your praises loud The enemy has been defeated. Come on, you're prophesying right now You're taking away the question marks You're making an exclamation point We're gonna lift our hands in victory We're gonna make your praises Say it, the enemy! The enemy has been defeated and dead. 